Good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Tristan, for recording this. Some New England Whitman alums requested that. Thank you very much, Nancy and the Blue Mountain Audubon Society for having me here this evening. I'm, I'm very excited about this. I still remember Chris Howard's presentation on going to the Alaska Peninsula. I love personal stories like that, and if you read the Union Bulletin last weekend, you know that this is a very personal story. So you're going to want to keep your notes on the green surface there. This is a touch screen. Okay. So it's going to. So how do I get it back slides. to full? There we go. Thank you. Oops. Let's go. That one. Claire said that I should explain the upper right picture of my brother and the upper left picture of my best friend Johnny Letcher. We're merely fooling around. They're each standing on a rock and the camera was turned 90 degrees. It was a very cloudy day, so you can't tell which way is up. And yes, that's me with my two brothers. I'm the one with the mop of the hair there. And the goldfinch is one of the birds that I saw while climbing these mountains in New England. But uh, I did not take the picture there. We are going to explore the highest peaks in New England from uh, Vermont's Mount Killington, which is south of Vermont's highest peak, Mount Mansfield, up through the White Mountains of New Hampshire, which uh, spread into, let's see, okay. Which, which spread into uh, Maine, where that mountain, the Horn, is, and then up to Mount Katahdin in northern Maine. Uh, my outline, which I never do for presentations, is tonight because you're going to wonder whether it's ever gonna, when it's ever going to end, but I'm actually planning to go pretty quickly. So I have an introduction, which I'm going to read, and then I'm going to ad lib on the geologic and human history of northern New England and uh, talk about climbing over all these peaks in northern New England, some bird pictures, and in between those segments I'm going to have single days of climbing. Most collections involve travel, even if only in your mind like coins and stamps. My grandmother gave me U.S. large cents before I was in first grade. Many of you have collections, like our mayor, Tom Scribner, with hubcaps and cycling in every state. I collect license plates. The best way for collecting is to go there, whatever you want or whatever you want to see. Some of you were with me when I was given a license plate in Tasmania. I collect trees. Last month, I completed a Western Washington collection, transplanting a subalpine larch from the North Cascades over to a place on Hood Canal. Most of you collect bird species. Mike and Mary Lynn will drive thousands of miles to see a new bird. Claire and I count birds on every visit to Hood Canal or and the Oregon coast, and we've seen roughly 130 there in or near our forest. Before I met Claire, I had never been beyond North America. As an army brat, she had lived all over the USA and the world. We started collecting states, provinces, continents, islands, and more mountains, starting with Saddle Mountain and Oregon's Coast Range, the South Sister in the Cascades, and Rock Chuck in the Tetons of Wyoming. I'm in the middle of three generations to send to ascend the Grand Teton. My uncle, a Navy pilot whose plane went down in World War II in the upper left, uh, the first Western peak for my 15-year-old brother and me in the upper right, and two of my sons uh, more recently. My dad got my brothers and me into mountains and rivers before we were teenagers, climbing Bluff Mountain on the... Uh, on the Appalachian Trail on the Blue Ridge Mountains. This is a view from our home. And he also taught us to canoe the Maury River or the North Fork of the James, which you can see in the upper left. 
He taught us how to rappel and paddle the J-stroke. I keep track of ascents as well as kayak and canoe voyages with spreadsheets. And there are spreadsheets on all kinds of things like mammals and birds, etc. I know who I was with, usually Claire, my brothers, my sons, and our Whitman students and, al and alums. I am particularly proud of having taken Whitman students climbing in the Wallawas, Olympics, Cascades, Andes, Italy, Africa, Mongolia, and Tibet. There are big mountains and little mountains. My favorites are volcanoes and high points of a state, a country, or a continent. The best are both volcanoes and high points, like Washington's Mount Rainier, Spain's Tidy in the Canary Islands, and Africa's uh, Kilimanjaro. I started Cascade High Volcanoes on Mount Rainier and Mount Hood with my brother in 1963. I led my sons up Mount Thielson and other Oregon volcanoes in the 1980s. They led me up my last two Cascade volcanoes, Glacier Peak in 2017 and Mount Thielson in 2018. Notice in the upper left picture that it looks like there's some dirt on the camera lens. Those are California tortoise shells. Despite gale force winds, tens of thousands of them were swirling around the summit. New England has little mountains, hundreds of them, many named even if less than 1,000 feet high. Look in the lower right, Big Tiptoe Mountain on Vinyl Haven Island is only 59 feet high, but it's on my list. Uh, why are these New England mountains magic to me? Partly because I spent my first 20 summers in New Hampshire and Maine. My ancestors settled there in the, in the uh, 1600s. New England's rocks are, are beautiful. This is, uh, the family home is on Cotton Hill and that's my mother and my grandmother climbing it before I was born. Uh, and it's not much of a hill, it's just that little mole there, but there I am, right there, I don't know, right there, let's see, oh well, I don't know how to get this thing, there we go, there I am right there, when I'm pretty young, so this is sort of uh, born into me. Uh, this is uh, the family home up there, and a picture taken in 1910, and in the background you can see Belknap Mountain, it's really close. So there are some pictures up on top of Belknap in the lower left and the lower right, and in the lower center is Cotton Hill seen from the top of Belknap. Uh, also viewed from the family home, and in the, the distance are Mount Chikarawa, that little triangular one, and Mount Washington, the highest peak in New England. We've climbed Chikarawa more times than I can count. It's very magic and requires a swim in Chikarawa Lake afterwards. And we've climbed Mount Washington many times. So now I'm going to jump to uh, the 19th of September when I am trying to finish beginning to try to finish the last seven of the New England 4,000 foot peaks. I went to Sugarloaf Ski Resort and I actually took the chairlift up to about there because I had always, already climbed Sugarloaf decades ago. And so then I hiked up to the top of Sugarloaf, which is right there. And when I get up there, this is the view. I had exceptionally clear weather for the first three days of hiking. Mount Katahdin in north central Maine, 85 miles away, and Mount Washington in New Hampshire, 78 miles away. The lower picture is just a view to the east from the top of Sugarloaf. And then I got on the Appalachian Trail, which you can see is a bunch of white blazes. I think you can pick them out on the rocks in the upper left-hand picture. And I'm headed for Mount Spaulding, which is right there. It's one of the ones that was determined to be over 4,000 feet high 
uh, after I had already hiked up Sugarloaf. So basically, I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures that I took as I walked along on these mountains. This is really typical for New England trails, uh, especially the Appalachian Trail. Uh, I happened to pass on the trail between Sugarloaf and Mount Spaulding a plaque commemorating the finish of the 2,000-mile Appalachian Trail, which, which occurred up there just south of Sugarloaf. Here is some bunchberry, a dogwood, and some granite, typical rock in New England. Uh, Aim Doyle helped me a lot with identification of the plants that I saw up there. So that's reindeer lichen, and there's a balsam fir in the lower left, and a red spruce in the upper right. So I get on top of Spalding, yay, and then I hike back to Sugarloaf, and the weather's still clear. So that was that day. Now I'm going to talk about the geologic and human history of northern New England, and I strongly recommend this book, which was given to me by AIM. New England is divided into what are called physiographic regions. You're all familiar with the uh, Adirondacks of New York. There are also the Green Mountains of Vermont, the White Mountains of New Hampshire, the highest peaks are the Presidentials, and they're basically where that green is. And then, as I said before, we have Mount Katahdin up in northern Maine. We've got Mount Cape Cod. Uh, we've got Cape Cod. We've got these uh, islands all along the southern edge of New England. We've got the uh, Connecticut River Valley, which I'll mention briefly after a while. And I'm going to show some pictures of some rocks on the island of Vinyl Haven because there's such a great variety of rocks there that they sort of reflect the rocks all over New England. So we have both volcanic igneous rocks, which are a result of explosions or of lava flows, and we have plutonic igneous rocks like granite, which have big crystals because they cool deep underground. We have metamorphic rocks, which are where pre-existing rocks have been subjected to temperature and pressure. And those three pictures are all from Vinyl Haven. That quarry in the background of the lower left-hand uh, picture is where many, many, the, the source of the building stone, the granite, for many, many buildings all over northeastern United States and at least as far south as Washington, D.C. And then there are quartz veins all over the place in New England. This one happens to be just below the summit of Mount Washington. A really quick resume of the geology of New England, and I mean this is really quick, is that the rocks there vary in age from over a billion years ago to uh, some volcanic activity which took place approximately 150 million years. Uh, there were many episodes in the Precambrian and in the Paleozoic, which gets us up to about 240 million years ago, of mountain building. And a lot of this mountain building was due to the fact that Africa was coming this way and running into North America and making the Appalachian Mountains, which are basically the same as the mountains in Scotland. And then in the Mesozoic, let's say 200 million years ago, rifting began. And that rifting initially was, if you can, I should have put up another slide, but the initial rifting was between Greenland and North America. And then we go jump down to the Bay of Fundy. And then we go to the Connecticut River Valley, right through New England, and down through uh, the Palisades on, on the west side of the Hudson at New York and down to Gettysburg and on down into southeastern United States. That's where the rifting began, but it was abandoned. And the rifting instead got, went east of Greenland and east of New England and east of the Appalachian and, and has continued since then. So everything that's to the east, the, the easternmost parts of, uh, let's see, I'm still getting this thing wrong. The easternmost parts of New England, for example, the eastern part of Massachusetts, these are rocks that were once part of Europe. They were not part of North America. At, 
at uh, about 400 million years ago, things were pretty exciting as this collision was occurring. And we had a bunch of super volcanoes between Mount Desert Island and Vinyl Haven. This, this picture shows uh, where's North America? Oh, this, pic this picture shows Laurentia, which is basically North America, and Baltica, which is basically Europe, colliding, and then eventually they rift. And one of the things that happened uh, in the, when these super volcanoes were erupting is there were bodies of granitic magma deep in the ground, and that granitic magma was intruded by basaltic magma. The basaltic magma is about 300 degrees Celsius hotter than the granitic magma. And so when the basalt went into the granitic magma, it was just like basalt going into seawater. It made pillow basalt. So these black masses that you see here are actually pillow basalts. Maybe you've heard about them before off of Hawaii or whatever. It doesn't matter what kind of liquid the basaltic magma goes into, as long as it's cool or it's going to form pillow basalts. So not much happened there after the Jurassic until the Ice Age began about two million years ago, and repeatedly ice from northern, from Canada, advanced south and buried all of New England. This, this map on the right shows the different kinds of glacial deposits that are all over the place. What's in brown are moraines built at the very edge of the glacier from uh, Long Island to Cape Cod, and the tan stuff that's below it is meltwater deposited sands and gravels from in front of the glacier. These glaciers left a heck of a lot of rocks in New England, therefore there are lots of stone walls all over New England where these rocks have been moved uh, to make, quote, fences, unquote. The, new, the uh, Appalachians, particularly in New England, are quite steep in places, and if a tropical storm gets stranded over the Appalachians and it gets tens of inches of rain in a few days, then there are lots and lots of landslides. And these scars are very prominent on distant, distant mountains and some of the trails, as in the lower right, cross these places where uh, mud and rocks came rushing down the side of the mountain. The glacial deposits are pretty thin over the bedrock, so if you get heavy rains, these loose sediments get saturated with water. The water can't drain into the bedrock fast enough, and so they just come down the mountain. And they, and they repeat in this, over and over in the same place until there's nothing left to slide down. So that, for example, this, uh, these trees here are probably about 20 years old. There had been what's called a debris avalanche there before the one that occurred the winter before I was hiking there. We know from pollen records what sorts of vegetation changes there have been in New England over the last 14,000 years ago when the ice uh, retreated. We know this from uh, Native American uh, legends and, and stories and what they made uh, canoes out of, etc. And but we we know most of this from pollen records, where we core the sediment on the bottom of a lake and look for organic matters to get radiocarbon dates. And as it says here, there was lots of red spruce right after the glaciers left, but then it got warmer, and so we had a lot of white pine. And then as it got warmer still. We got a lot of the hardwoods that are listed there. But there was local cooling. Another glaciation might have been starting before humans interfered with global climate change. And this local cooling resulted in the decline of Canadian hemlock. And now the warming due to humans is resulting in sugar maple decline. One of the things that has always fascinated me is how the percentage of forest cover in New England has changed. So when the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, there was about 90% forest in New England. And then by the late 1800s, depending on whether you were in southern New England or northern Maine or whatever, 
there was 25 to 70 percent of the forest. Uh, however, by the early 1980s, because farmers had left and population had increased that much, we were back up to 75 percent forest, and it is now slowly declining due to population increase. There are some particular uh, features or items or uh, actions which have taken place which have really influenced the history of New England. I was very surprised to learn when I was doing some research for a conference on how many beavers there had been. Up to 16 beaver dams per kilometer. So that's like 25 per mile. I've seen this in places in, in the Colorado mountains. These wetlands are so important for groundwater recharge, flood reduction, trapping nutrients and sediment, etc. As it says here, in about 1620, there were believed to be between 60 and 400 million beavers in North America. And today, there are about 6 to 12 million beavers. They are increasing. They have become more numerous since uh, they were nearly trapped to extinction, commercial extinction. In, in the book which I referred to, uh, I was quite surprised to learn about how many sheep there had been in New England. Only 4,000 were introduced in 1810, and only 30 years later, there were more than 2 million sheep in Vermont and New Hampshire. They needed places for the sheep to graze, and so they cleared the forests, often by burning them. They killed the wolves and other predators. They built a lot of wooden fences, but they also took all those rocks that the glaciers had left and built stone walls four and a half feet high so the sheep couldn't jump over them. This burning of the forests and this overgrazing caused severe soil erosion, which silted up river and led to lots of flooding, despite the thousands of dams that had been built in New England, which I'll get to in a minute. I learned in person from someone and then was able to read about it uh, on the internet about some incidents that occurred at Mount Monadnock in southern New Hampshire. They lit a fire in 1801 to burn off the forests for more pasture, for more sheep. But there were wolves up in the small patch of forest that was left on the very summit. So in about 1804, they burned that. And the last wolf was killed in, I think, 1810 in southern New Hampshire. And for geologists, all this burning and soil erosion left some pretty spectacular geologic exposures. I mentioned dams. More than 14,000 dams in New England. The dams were for flour mills, for lumber mills, for woolen mills, and all sorts of industry. But these occupations were somewhat abandoned because farmers moved to the Midwest, decreasing the population. By the time they'd cut all the trees, things weren't very good for lumber mills. And because of unions and wages, uh, the industry moved to the south. Uh, they started using not only the wool from, from New England and Australia and elsewhere, but also the cotton from the south. These dams blocked anadromous fish and an a catadromous species their populations of individual species were reduced by 90 to 99 percent. And then dam removal began, and you can see one example there in the Maine, in Maine. My brother was one of the uh, 
he was executive director of the Natural Resources Council of Maine, and his mission was to stop dams from being built like the Big A Dam and to have dams taken out that were blocking fish. So the first federally licensed power producing dam in the United States to be removed uh, was in 1999 on, at the Edwards Dam in Augusta with church bells ringing and three TV networks uh, there. There's a picture in the lower right of where the dam used to be. The predictions about how long it would take the river to get re-oxygenated and how long it would take the dozen or so species of anadromous fish to come back up all had estimates that were way too long. There was a great fishing season in the fall of 1999 and the water quality improved much faster than predicted because they had forgotten to take into account the oxygenation of water moving over rocks. Acid precipitation hit New England and the Adirondacks pretty hard. Most of the bedrock in that area is granitic or at least has lots of quartz and feldspar in it. And so the lakes are naturally acidic and so was the soil. Then we had this addition of sulfur from the power plants in the upper Midwest. Eastern, Eastern coal is pretty rich in sulfur compared to Western coal. And this acid deposition made the soil in the lakes more acidic, so forests died and fish died. But now, and starting many decades ago, and this is a big, uh, a big positive for U.S. industry, we stopped or greatly reduced sulfur dioxide caused acid deposition. So the spruce are rebounding, and that, uh, that helped the lakes as well as putting ground up limestone into the lakes, reducing their acidity. So things are doing much better than they were a few decades ago. Now let's go to the 20th of September and climb another New England 4,000 footer. It's Mount Abraham. The parking area is right here and it was actually hard to find the trailhead, but uh, all I had to do was walk from here to here, only about four miles, a delightful walk. A timber line is particularly low on Mount Abraham. Here I am looking down from the mountain, uh, top from the block fields on top. Uh, there were, as usual, many interesting plants uh, along the way, uh, mushrooms, witch's brew is that, uh, or witch's butter is uh, those little orange blobs in the lower left. And it turned out that the peak of New England fall colors was earlier than usual this year. So I got to see a lot of really beautiful maples and other trees. Here is more of the reindeer lichen, plus a bane berry, and in the upper right, balsam fir. Uh, here are uh, some views uh, approaching the Appalachian Trail and asking people to stay on the trail. I don't know why anybody would go off because everywhere else there are trees. And uh, the rocks are challenging to walk across, but you get there. And all of a sudden I'm on top of Mount Abraham. The, uh, the, in the upper left-hand picture it shows the way I had come up and the way I went down. In the lower left is Spalding and Sugarloaf where I had been the day before. In the lower right are some cairns that people built just because it's a cool thing to do on top of the mountains. So that's uh, Mount Abraham. Now we're going to uh, summarize the, the climbs in these individual states. So there are the five peaks over 4,000 feet high in uh, Vermont. I climbed Mount Mansfield in 1960 with the Cornell University Outdoor Program, and then climbed Camel's Hump on an icy day. Uh, he was at Dartmouth in 1993, and had a great time finishing the last three Vermont 4,000 footers with my brother. Uh, there we are in the upper left at the trailhead, 
Then we climbed another Mount Abraham and Mount Ellen. And then we spent that night drinking beer. And on the next day, finished them off with Mount Killington. On to the New Hampshire 4,000 footers. There are a bunch of them. There were 46 and all of a sudden there became 48. So I started uh, with the presidentials and uh, my dad dropped me off right here in uh, whatever year it says that is, 1959. And I just followed the yellow trail down here, down there all along the crest of the presidential range and up to there and then my dad picked me up here two days later. It was really wonderful. And then later I climbed Mount Jackson, which is, which is down here with Claire and later with somebody else, I climbed, uh, where is it? Mount Clinton with a whole bunch of people. So that's sort of the heart of the high peaks in New Hampshire. Uh, Mount Washington, my family and I have climbed many, many times. Like most New England mountains, it's, it's very rounded because it was buried under a mile of ice. Uh, the summit of Mount Washington uh, has weather that you would find hundreds and hundreds of miles further north. It makes its own weather gets almost 100, 100 inches of precipitation a year. Uh, it had the world's record for wind speed until it was beaten in Antarctica at 231 miles an hour. Uh, it has, had, has very cold temperatures, about minus 40 in Celsius or Fahrenheit, and many, many people have died there, and many, many more people have been rescued due to sudden weather changes. Uh, there are lots of ways to get up there. They basically had a trail for horses in 1835, an auto road in 1861, a cog railo railroad, which you can see in the lower left in 1869. This mountain gets 250,000 visitors a year, most coming up by train or car. It's, it's interesting to do this, this climb. You've got about a 4,000 foot ascent and you get on top and there are people in high heels. <laughs> the second highest range in New Hampshire uh, is called Lafayette, Lincoln, and Liberty. And I did that in, uh, on June 21st, 1961 with my friend Johnny Letcher. And then in uh, 1990, I thought I could easily finish the New Hampshire 4,000 footer, so I went up Mount Isolation, which is farthest from any road, so it's a 15 mile round trip. Uh, and there's a picture up on the top that somebody else took. And then with relatives climbed Mount Wombeck and rode off to the Appalachian Mountain Club and said, I'm done, send me my patch, please. And they had done some surveying that indicated that two of the mountains which I had passed within a mile of on earlier climbs were all of a sudden new 4,000 footers. So uh, Chris said, let's do it, Dad. And so we climbed uh, the North Twin and the South Twin and Galehead to get number 47 or whatever it is in New Hampshire, yeah. And then Gio, and then uh, Bond, and West Bond to get to Bond Cliff, which was number 48, and then to get back to our car, Mount Zealand. It was a truly memorable day, lots of fun. Uh, we've got our fingers up telling how many mountains we, we've climbed that day. So jumping to Maine, you could see from this list from my 1961 guidebook that there were 12. But all of a sudden, there are 14. Fortunately, this summer before I went up there to do what I thought was going to be the last five, I checked the internet, and all of a sudden, there are 14 instead of 12. And then I was on the next to the last one, and I met this guy on the Appalachian Trail. He said, there are more than 14, there are 15. You've got it wrong. And I said, you've got to be kidding. I had this all planned. And he got out his smartphone, which I don't own. He said, oh, you're right, there are only 14. <laughs> so uh, uh, Mount Katahdin's 
phenomenal. I've climbed it 10 or 11 times, and I won't go into the detail of, of all these different routes, but uh, one day we started, uh, I actually took a bunch of kids, and we hiked from uh, Roaring Brook, which is there, up to Russell Pond and talked to the ranger and said, we're gonna try to climb Mount Traveler tomorrow. And he said, there's no way you would do it with these kids. And I said, you don't know these kids. And we did it. And instead of going back to Rory Brook, we went over Mount Katahdin on the way back. That was, that was a four day trip, really, really exciting. And then uh, Claire and I climbed the North Brother and two other peaks once upon a time. And then someday or other, I went up over that peak there. So Mount Katahdin is spectacular. You can read what, read what Governor Baxter wrote there. Uh, it has very high relief. It is the only mountain in the east that looks like western mountains. Uh, what happened was that a cirque glacier developed right here. Remember, all these mountains were buried by more than a mile of ice. But after it melted away, a cirque glacier was left right here and it really sharpened up Mount Katahdin, making this feature right here, which is called the Knife Edge. Uh, in 1961, my brother and my friend Johnny and I decided we would do a technical climb of Mount Katahdin, and it was very exciting. You can see the, the pictures there, as well as the three of us on the summit. A, a Whitman, uh, alum took these pictures in the top of the, uh, of the, she took them of the knife edge. You ask how wide it is, people will say four feet or 10 feet or two feet or whatever. In 1999, Claire and I climbed Mount Katahdin during the, on the Appalachian Trail and the weather looks pretty darn good in those lower left-hand two pictures. We got up on the summit, which has something called a tableland on the west end, as well as the knife edge on the right end. On the, on the east end, and there were people wandering around in shorts and sweatshirts, lost. They had come up from Chimney Pond, and it was a whiteout, and some of them were going down to the west, going down the Appalachian Trail, the way we, we had come up. A lot of people have died and been rescued on Mount Katahdin. I think Claire and I saved a few. Uh, so there in the upper right, I'm on the top in a whiteout. Okay, and then over the years, I climbed four more of the 4,000 footers, uh, upper two solo, uh, lower two with my brothers in 2005, and then I didn't do anything until this past summer. So uh, one day, it was an 11 hour day, I climbed three of them in one day, and we'll just look at some pictures of that. I love Indian pipe, and Ames supplied me with better picture than the one I took in the upper left. There's South Crocker, and I get on top of that, I've got four fingers up, I've got four mountains to go. Off in the distance is Sugarloaf, which I had climbed two days before. Um, there's some more pictures of trees and mushrooms, and Mount Crocker, which is the next one I'm gonna do, and there you can see I've got three mountains to go. I wanna get on top there. And then I have to go back over South Crocker and go up Reddington, which supposedly was trailless, but so many people try to climb, not all of the New England peaks, but many, many people try to climb all the New Hampshire 4,000 footers. So there was a sort of a way to go uh, because I thought part of it was gonna be trailless and because the second growth trees are so close together, as you can see in the lower left picture, I decided to leave my pack behind and it was a really, another really warm, clear day. I got pretty thirsty, and so I took a gamble and drank out of the spring that you saw there. And it looked like the best way to do, the thing to do instead of going right along the extremely forested ridge was to go down the mountain, and I found an old logging road, which you can see there on the left. And there were some old stumps from, from the original cuts. All these mountains in New England, except Mount Katahdin, almost all of them were completely logged. There's almost no virgin forest left in New England. And so uh, finally I get on top of Mount Reddington 
and there were two U.S. flags up there. I'm beside one of them on the summit sign, and there's another one on the right showing, in the lower right picture, showing where I had come from that day. So back over uh, South Crocker and uh, down the mountain. So these are, I did not take any pictures of birds on, on those four days, but I did, I did have some other pictures that I had taken in the mountains of New England, which I want to share with you and thank various folks, including Mike Denny and Claire for doing identification. Uh, wild turkeys are all over New England. Uh, there are some crows in the top of that tree. And, and now I'm going to switch to pictures of birds taken by others that I saw, because after all, this is an Audubon meeting. And uh, the, the East really has some spectacular birds. I mean, we do in the West, too. But you got to love chickadees. They're everywhere. And I, I was not familiar with tufted titmouse, but I told Claire what it looked like, and she told me over the phone what it was. They were all over uh, the New England mountains. Lots of bluebirds. Lots of hummingbirds, which I assume, and I'm not sure, were ruby-throated. Uh, lots and lots of sparrows. Uh, White-breasted nuthatch, another one of probably everybody's favorite birds. And dark-eyed juncos are everywhere, always in flocks. They were, they were hovering around my head on some of the trails. And then I'm just throwing in, because this is an Audubon meeting, a few more pictures of birds. Uh, that I saw while kayaking. Uh, bald eagles. That's the best picture I had of the bald eagles there, so my son Ben gave me his picture from uh, the Rogue River. Uh, there's a great blue heron at Tidewater. And some photos of birds that I saw lots of on the coast. I love cormorants, but didn't get any good pictures, so and of course, everybody loves loons. Okay, let's go to the last day, the equinox. So I'm going to start at uh, the trail, the uh, base of the Saddleback Ski Area, and I'm going to walk up that dotted line uh, right up the slope, and then I'm going to follow the Appalachian Trail over the Horn. This would have been easy, except that I didn't take that picture there. There were gale force winds and it was rain all day long. And I was kind of warm on the inside, but I was just freezing on the outside. And uh, it's, it's one, of, one of the probably two roughest parts of the entire Appalachian Trail. So here I am simply hiking up the ski trail. And in the lower right, you can see a tiny pond. You really can't tell from scale, but that's just a little scour depression from the glaciers that buried these mountains. And, and there's what the trail looks like in the lower lift as you uh, approach Timberline. Uh, saddle, the, it's a very short to get from the top of the ski area to uh, Saddleback. I've got one finger up, I've got one left to go. And I just want to show you some pictures of this route and this wind and this rain. That's not a trail except that it's got white marks, so it is the Appalachian Trail. This is rock climbing. And I mean, it's, it's bouldering. It's dangerous, especially when the rocks are wet. But most of the way, it's just like this. Bare rock, lots and lots of cairns. I found it very beautiful. Lots of interesting plants. and lichen. The mountain ash was turning colors. The, the green stuff is bog laurel, and there's the reindeer lichen again, and the green ones in the left, or rather, excuse me, the red stuff is blueberry. So there are the last flowers I found of bog laurel and some balsam fir, and there's a lot of rain on my camera lens. That's why the lower left picture looks the way it did. But there were actually still blueberries to eat. 
and despite the cold and the wet, I stopped to have a few. This trail is so rugged <laughs> that in one place, there's a ladder to get up over a rock. The, the geology, because of all this bare rock, was really pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, despite the weather, I took time to look at the granite, and you can see the bands in the gneiss in the upper left-hand picture. So I really loved this day, despite the weather, and all of a sudden, I'm on top, and there are none left. Thank you. Please feel free to go, but I'm glad to entertain questions. Yes, sir. Bob, did you uh, ever think about going into uh, New York State and the Adirondack Mountains? Yes, while well, I was at, at Cornell in the outdoor program, uh, I went with friends uh, to climb Mount Marcy and Mount McIntyre. I should have spent more time in the Adirondacks, but I also uh, hiked in the Catskills. Mostly what I did in New York State was to climb at the gunks near Poughkeepsie, the Silurian quartzite cliff that some people thought think is the best rock climbing in the east. Bob, here is a bottle of, for you. Oh my gosh, can I drink it now? I don't have a mask on. Vinegar, so, uh, oh, don't drink it. Don't drink it now. <laughs> so a, per a, a personal story. Claire and I drove to Houston to go climb the high volcanoes of Mexico and the temperature was about 95 and the humidity was about 99 and I got to a friend's house in Houston I said I'm dying of thirst he was going to go with us and he said there's apple cider in the refrigerator I open the door and I see this thing that says apple cider on it and I don't read the last word and I chugged it it was apple cider vinegar, and I thought I was going to die. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, folks. <laughs>